here and uh, uh, having you, you had opportunities to work with him and listen to him. Uh, so, um, again, he finished school in Barcelona. Uh, uh, and uh, you opened the office actually, let's say, at the beginning of this century. <laughs> See, More we don't less, know exactly right? when, but yeah. Yeah, somehow, yeah. when you finish yeah. the school, actually, yeah. you more or less immediately start to join together, to work together in Barcelona and mm -hmm. um, in Catalonia. So, uh, basically, um, uh, as we know, uh, we have also some Catalan architects, young architects, so the younger architects here present in this lecture, so thank you for coming uh, tonight uh, with you. So your work is very diverse. Uh, it's related to the, let's say, um, although Anne is coming to Barcelona uh, from Finland, but nevertheless, you're working in the context of uh, Catalan, uh, let's say, culture, architectural production. Uh, so certain uh, relation, definitely deep relation with the, with the architectural uh, history tradition mm. of uh, Barcelona Catalan architects since uh, Eugenie's uh, father, Jaume Bach, uh, is a well-known architect, especially uh, for those uh, who were interested or who still are interested in the production of really production, no? not only the, 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 the uh, beautification processes that is going on in Ljubljana on the public spaces. So public spaces of Barcelona in the years of 80s, let's say, that was the, the really, even today, I know you, some of you recently visited Barcelona, and I, I believe even today those, uh, those production of, of public space and uh, let's say opening the city to the citizens uh, is something that uh, we have to admire and appreciate. Nevertheless, uh, you are working on different scales as well uh, from the renovation of the very small building, let's say, as you said today, uh, talking about the Plechnik Obelisk of Napoleon, monument to Napoleon, uh, when presented one to one meter <laughs> dimension of the obelisk, uh, you will have a one square meter project as well. Um, nevertheless, just to announce the fall lecture, so in September we, we will um, welcome your colleagues here from uh, Paris, Plan Commun, and from Berlin, Fogg Architects. So, um, what else to say? Uh, that you are professors, of course, this needs to be said on the Faculty of Architecture, uh, so not only at ETSAP, the let's say the most prominent school, but not only in Catalonia, but also uh, a bro broader Spain and let's say Mediterranean part at least, um, as well as uh, some other schools uh, you teach. You create important, uh, in this case, uh, Iberico, Spanish, uh, um, let's say, exhibitions, uh, Biennales and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which is important to you also what an architect is doing or uh, could do in the sense of the benefit of the, not only our profession, but also, I believe, the society. So, uh, Eugenie, Anne and Eugenie are very open and very, uh, are quite much following what is going on in Barcelona, uh, last, let's say, five, uh, whatever, years. With, uh, with, no, actually, eight years with, uh, with, uh, with your mayor, uh, few ah, yes, mayor, yes, yes. Uh, which is, I hope there will be also some debate in this case. This case is also, or this series is meant for you, young, for uh, becoming architects, to, to establish a certain dialogue with them uh, on different topics, not only how to open an architectural office, but as well some other more important stuff in our uh, life. Uh, reality. Uh, maybe this was all. Ah, yes, <laughs> I forgot to announce just with uh, uh, nice lunch we had in uh, Ljubljana uh, before. They, I discovered but, that they are really fans of Slavic music. So you are allowed to ask them everything about Slavic music <laughs> in relation to architecture topics or whatever you like. So thank you also for that. Thank you for coming again, and uh, please, yeah, we are going okay. to join definitely your okay. lecture, so the podium is yours. Um, okay. Thank you. Again, please. Okay. Well, thank you, today for inviting us. Thank you to the uh, uh, architecture school, you know, Faculty of Architecture in Ljubljana. Uh, it's our first time here, 
Uh, and so far, what we have seen, we have liked a lot. So, and we are staying a couple more days. So, we hope to come back to Barcelona saying that this city is marvelous and that there's people in this, in this place is as well. Let's see. Um, it's good that you put the lights down because in our lectures, in general, we like people to go as if they went to the movies. You just relax, just sit there, don't take any notes. We will entertain. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, just enjoy, enjoy. Let's hope that you enjoy. Usually people say that they enjoy. Maybe they lie very well, but let's hope that. In this way, it would be also good that when you get out from the lecture, you would comment like, did you like the movie? Was it OK? Go and have, take a beer or something and continue talking about it. That would be our, our uh, objective would be like, accomplished. OK, because um, let's see. Uh, today already did a short introduction, but I will do a very, a very short and more visual one so that you, because we always, whenever we are invited somewhere, we always think that people don't know anything about us. Maybe we are wrong, but it's better to go like that because like this you explain. If they knew already, well, you refresh. If they don't know, they have a glimpse of what we are doing. But, um, well, today already explained an important thing for us, and it is that we, are, uh, we have a practice in architecture, okay? So we, we do architecture, uh, but we are very much committed to uh, the university, to teaching, uh, and to culture as well. So um, right now we are the curators of the Spanish Architecture and Urbanism Biennial, which is, well, as it says the name, during two years. But we have been very active in different associations and, and institutions in Barcelona that promote, basically that promote um, explaining architecture to society. Because our architects, we have a very difficult problem, and it is that when we speak, people don't understand us. We speak strange. And this is something that we have heard from many people, that you architects, you use a vocabulary, you, we don't understand you. And we have to learn to explain things much better, because otherwise we won't communicate and, we won't, and people won't see how necessary actually architecture is. I don't know if architects, but architecture is. OK, so in this variety of projects, we work in, well, we, have, we, we like working in a very full spectrum of architecture, from installations and even from design of parties, like this one. This was the design of a party that had to last just for one night, for four hours. So it's one of these projects that more than the project, what you have to think is how you mount it and demount it in one hour, okay, and how you do it quickly and how you, for example, in this case, you give as a present the lamps of the party to the people who came to the party so that the lamps, they go to the houses of everybody. So you somehow reuse them, you don't throw them, it's, they are just normal IKEA lamps. Or other installations like this one in Ulot, I, I will just go because, or oh, well, more complex things like um, ephemeral installations, but that they are 5,000 square meter big. So in this case, it's an, it's a, it's for the construction fair in Barcelona, when there used to be construction fairs, not anymore. Uh, and it is, um, well, uh, an installation that was built in four days, lasted for three days, and had to be demounted in two. So all the strategy, it's not about, it's not about the project in itself, but of what's the system behind the uh, project, no? What's the strategy? Well, other installations that they are more related, ah, they are in that, we like borders of things. We like things that they are not clear. We like perversion in a way, okay? Not to be a pervert, that's another thing, but we like perversion. And we work many times in the boundaries between architecture and art. This is an installation we did one year ago, maybe. Well, time flies, so maybe it was two. Uh, but we will, we will explain in more detail uh, uh, an installation that maybe you have seen, you will see later. But in this case, it was playing with the perception of things. We like very much to play with perception. No? So in this case, with mirrors, we were changing the nature of, uh, of a 17th century cellar, wine cellar. Uh, interior design projects, uh, lots of refurbishments in Barcelona. Uh, you have to think that most of our practice was during a time when uh, projects were very small. We were in the middle of the crisis, in the middle of the uh, independence crisis, 
and uh, with the pandemic. So our life, no, actually our life, it's, it's a full crisis all the time, no? So projects have been small. And actually, the projects that we will show today, they are all small, okay? Uh, we have, it's not a question of scale of if it's big, if it's important, if it's small, no. But we just chose some small projects that maybe they explain very well what we want to explain today, which is the title of the, of the lecture, which may be a little bit uh, confusing, no? Because it's useless, imperfect, and slow. As you can see, we are not very good in marketing ourselves, so we won't get very far away because we are just saying that we are like that, useless, imperfect, and slow. But you will see that actually these terms, that's, what, that's the aim of the lecture, to explain that these terms that may seem negative in a first hand, actually depends on how you see them, they can be very positive. And we think that these terms in architecture, actually, they are very positive. So, well, uh, small projects or divertimentos, we call them in this case, housing projects, uh, all of them or most of them, well, no, not, not, not that many, but mostly in Catalonia around Barcelona, okay? Yeah, more housing, etc. Maybe I will go faster. This uh, project that we are working right now of an old Jugend house in, in next to La Padrera, to Gaudí's La Padrera, we are re redoing all the, all the flats. And this is, we have been actually quite much working on public space. This is um, a boulevard in Ulot, in the town of RCR Architects, and actually touching one of their projects, so it was a little bit delicate. Luckily, we are good friends with them, so nothing happened, but we had to demolish a small part of one thing from them. A, a square in Barcelona, well, etc. And this is a, a project that we have been working now for five or six years. It's a kindergarten and, and youth center in Barcelona that we hope we will start the works quite soon. And then what we said that we like very much to be involved in, in teaching and in different universities. So we have, we have been invited and we always have accepted to do workshops in different universities like this one in Antwerp, like very small workshops where actually you just have ver a very little time no, to, to achieve something. No? Like this one, for example, that in five days the students, they build this, this shadow canopy on the, on the roof of their, of their school. Or this is the, the exhibitions of the biennial that I was commenting. And all this you can find in our website and in blogs, etc., magazines, but also in some books either on our work or books that we have written, like for example, this one, it's a book that actually we wrote to explain what is architecture to society. So it's a book intended to non-architects. Actually, if you read it, you will say, these guys, they are not saying anything new because it's not directed to you. It's more for first, second year students and maybe people that it's not from the world of architecture. Okay, so this gives a big variety of projects, but the thing, the important thing more than the projects that you can see them in many places, the important thing is to explain maybe these three concepts. And maybe we will start, no, Anna, you go with this one, with the first one. So like uh, Eugenie said, uh, often these terms are read in a negative way. Uh, if we tell ourselves as useless, imperfect and slow, it's terrible. Uh, but all of these uh, terms, they have a positive side of them or they should be rethought in a, in a more positive way. Uh, the uselessness, <laughs> uh, it kind of uh, gets our attention, this idea of useless. There's also in, an insult that we love in Spanish, that it's inútil. It's like that you don't serve for anything. It's, of course, terrible. But uh, this uh, thing of the inutilita uh, came from the Nuki Ordines, who is a um, literature professor of literature in the University of Sapienza in Roma, and he wrote this book that's absolutely uh, recommended from our part uh, about the idea that in the contemporary world. Uh, very many things are uh, somehow skipped as use, uh, useless. And he kind of tries to uh, explain the, you know, the use or the usefulness of uh, classics in literature, for example. 
uh, and he uh, speaks in this book very much about uh, teaching and teaching literature. But it's very easy to, uh, to understand the discourse of Nuki Ordine and think of it uh, applied in architecture. So uh, what the society wants of architects uh, is that we would be, um, that we would be uh, specialized, that we would uh, be efficient, uh, that we would be like a, a greased part of the, of the system. And the architectonic, more uh, deep discussion, let's say it's not uh, seen as anything very, very useful. Uh, we like to, to look at this uh, small uh, slide or, or um, page of a book of Alison and Peter Smithson where Alison does this little uh, illustrated list of small pleasures of life. And somehow uh, these are very useful, uh, useful uh, notes from an architect to try to provide uh, um, places where you can stand and look without a glare uh, through a window or be protected somehow um, by the architecture or just close your things behind cupboard doors. So um, we shouldn't be too efficient to, to forget the little uh, pleasures of life and all of us we kind of have to list uh, our pleasures of life to think how we can produce more and more little pleasures in life, though we are acting in this very efficient society. Uh, in this context, I will show you this uh, little housing project of ours. It's a small promotion of three uh, very, very small flats. It's the smallest uh, plurifamiliar housing that you can probably do. Uh, three flats of square me uh, 40 square meters each. Uh, in a neighborhood called Orta in, in Barcelona. Um, the people who know something about Barcelona would know that Barcelona has uh, the old part of the town, and then there is the Ensanche, which is this uh, um, big and maybe most characteristic area of Barcelona of the square grid. And then the square grid at some point uh, arrives to these uh, villages like Gracia, Orta, and, and Sanz, and other, other places. And these independent villages, they get sucked into the city structure. So they, we can very easily see, uh, very clearly, somehow still like the borders of the village. And we can see a certain kind of very particular city structure that is specific for, uh, for Orta. And we are working on this plot that is in the middle of this very, very traditional uh, village uh, structure. Right. So in, uh, on a plot that is typical for the area, has this, uh, uh, the same width as the, most of the, the neighboring plots, uh, same characteristics, uh, nothing really special. But what is special on this part of the street is uh, Somehow Orta is made of this. This, this is the Orta material that, that the streets are made of. And what we have here is the special case of a neighbor that didn't adjust to the, to the grain of the, of the village. Uh, built one floor more, uh, you will see used a different materiality, used a different uh, um, uh, proportion of windows, and so on and so forth. So, what we did with the project is, was to look at the popular, the ordinary architecture of, uh, of this neighborhood. And somehow uh, started to think how we could, um, we could implant these very simple items of wall, plinth, window, balcony, or a blind to a contemporary building. Not very interested in the idea of the contemporary, more of the idea of building uh, a small part of the city, a small part of the street with our housing building. And so we did this uh, very simple analysis of, of how these elements end up uh, appearing in the, in the neighboring buildings, but always with, uh, with the almost the exception of the, of the neighboring house. So what we do is we fill in this gap with a more or less um, quiet architecture with um, uh, with a plinth, 
plain CI here with, uh, with just simple wall structure, vertical windows with blinds and so on and so forth. Yeah, somehow with the same vocabulary that we find around. No? The idea is to make city, no? to, to finish the street. So we just see what's the vocabulary and, around. And to and form part. Here you see the, the, somehow with the volumetry we see already that okay we do uh, intentionally we try to form part, uh, both of the uh, neighbors are new but somehow the, the, the one who kind of, mm, uh, kind of doesn't respect any of these, uh, any of these um, common rules is this, uh, this neighbor that it gets even a little bit higher and that's where we also do our uh, somehow useless window uh, to kind of uh, hug the ugly neighbor and say that, okay, let's try to pull you back to the, to the group and, uh, and continue the city life. Here we can see that it's the material, it, it's, the, it's the little twist that it does, it's the window uh, shape and all, all of this building is somehow rude in the, in the city structure. So we try to be like a little a bit like this happy, optimistic guy who, who does a, a little gesture of, of building this um, uh, hypothetical or, or virtual uh, third floor to, to uh, adapt to the, to the height of the, yeah, because the, the other Because the other option would have been to just put dynamite no, to that building and blow it up. But it seemed that it wasn't maybe the best option. So, okay, if we can't well, destroy it... Well, it wasn't it, our thing to do. No, let's, let's at least forgive, no? forgive him. No, that, okay, come on, you behave bad, but you, you are welcome back to the street. Yeah. Okay, then uh, just uh, simple architecture, uh, low budget, uh, three, flat, uh, three mini flat uh, promotion can't be very economically ambitious. Uh, they were rental, they are rental flats, so all the game that we play as architects uh, in, the, in a way of giving identity or uh, giving uh, a form to the things had to be um, silly and, and um, like small tricks, like how do you put the local stone in a way that somehow we can use small pieces first of all, so more economical, but also that it gives a certain dignity to the facade and then also we have this very uh, antipathic or, or negative uh, element that we need which is this uh, uh, security, um, how do you call it, mesh, mesh or, or fence or whatever. So we try to um, make it a motive in the, in the, down, uh, in the ground floor facade uh, in this way. And then there's of course this uh, lost window that also in the ter upstairs terrace gives a different relation to the, to the surrounding city and the surrounding uh, roof, rooftop life. Then as it's a very small, uh, small building, uh, the trick or the, the gesture that we make in the floor plan is very simple. It's just to uh, be a little bit ambiguous with the two spaces that form the flat. So there is a kitchen, there is a bathroom, there is a, a very big uh, staircase in proportion because it has to allow to, for, uh, for uh, this invalid uh, transportation system, the, the, this platform. So uh, what we have is two very equal spaces and this makes it possible to have it this, uh, this house in, in several ways. At the moment, for example, these flats are shared um, between students. They are sh student flats shared uh, as there are two pretty large, being a small flat, two pretty large uh, rooms and then common kitchen and co uh, common uh, bathroom. Then in the downstairs floor in the, in the um, uh, ground floor, there is a, a terrace in the end of the, on the plot. And upstairs in the roof, we organize these two similar size uh, spaces as well. So all these very small four, three flats, they all have an exterior space of their, their own. And then the yellow is another uh, other gesture. Uh, Orta originally is a very colorful city or, or part of the city. Uh, the colors have faded out very much, but, uh, but still um, 
all the houses, all the traditional houses in Orta, they had to choose a color for the, their door, for their blinds, and for all the wooden elements. And often they were very colorful. So in that way, uh, we can uh, justify our, our yellow, but it's also, it is a, uh, it's a gesture that kind of low cost, poor uh, architecture can always use color. It's like the poor man's friend there's always paint. The things that you have to paint, you can paint them either gray and you are very elegant, or you can uh, paint them yellow and you're not so elegant maybe, but on the other hand, uh, in a fairly narrow street and a fairly narrow patio, you give light and you give a little bit like uh, happiness to the, to the feeling. Also thinking that these are very small flats, they are probably the first housing for for young students or they are temporary housing for somebody who's studying uh, medicine, uh, there's a big hospital very close to, to here or so and so. It wouldn't be a house, ho house for the rest of your life and you wouldn't even be tired uh, of, the, of the yellow in the time that you, you spend here. So here we can see very simple materials, even some uh, areas that there is no real finishing in the, in the rooms other than the the paint, and then some simple details. We have here the shades are, uh, of course in the Mediterranean you would imagine that the shades are to protect from the sun, and of course it is uh, that way as well, but we have two opposite facades. One is uh, sunnier than the other one, and the street facade actually doesn't receive so much sun, but there you have a neighbor very, very close. So then the, the shades have more the function of, uh, of mediating with the intimacy of the, of the place. So, imperfect. Imperfect, okay. To explain, to explain what we mean about, or why we think that imperfection is a good ally, uh, ally, ally, do you say like that, ally, in our work? Ali. No, Ali, Ali, I don't know. You understand what I mean? Uh, we'll, we'll explain it with a couple of projects. And this well, one, to be said, sorry, mm. it has to be said that perfection is very much appreciated in architecture and in the studies of architecture. We want things to be extremely perfect, and that's a good goal, but sometimes it is good to think on the backside and to question a little bit this uh, uh, education in perfection. Mira, see, actually, I, 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 this wasn't planned but um, so that you visualize it. Or actually, when we, one of the times that we understood that perfection, perfection wasn't such a good ally for life, basically, it was visiting a Peter Zunter project that everything was so perfect, so magnificent, everything that is concrete was perfect, the lights, everything that we entered in and the first thing we thought was that, hey, are we, are we handsome enough? Are we dressing well? I mean, do we, be, do we belong to this wall? Are we spoiling the space? We had that feeling. And when a piece of architecture uh, throws you out, we have a problem, okay? I'm not criticizing Peter Thunter, of course. I mean, please, I didn't say anything. Erase it, okay? Uh, but, um, but that's a problem, no? And, well, we try to work in architecture that, that doesn't put these problems on the table, okay? That you can go with your, I don't know, with your ugly uh, pink panther toffles and nothing happens, no? Or that you go with your golden medallion here, no? With all the, and nothing happens because well, architecture nothing, allows... Nothing bad happens, uh, at yeah. least. <laughs> because architecture allows life to happen. Okay, but this... Maybe we'll explain it with this project. This is an installation we did some years ago uh, in the uh, Barcelona Pavilion, okay? By Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich in Barcelona. You all, uh, you all know this building, okay? And what we did, I will try to go straight to the point because do you know what's the problem? We, we like very much, not, not, not this, not what we do. We like very much architecture. And then we have the problem that we talk too much, or especially me. So. Lectures get long and long and long. I will try to, okay, make it short uh, because otherwise this, this is too much. Okay, but what did we do? We just measured all the surfaces of the pavilion. I will go straight to what we chose a material that should be white, removable, and matte, 
that was very important without reflections because actually the reflections are one of the essential materials of the Barcelona Pavilion. Okay, and what we did, we did some tests, we explained the guys how they had to cut and put the, these vinyl sheets, not like he's doing there, okay? It had to be with a ruler and respecting all the joints and respecting absolutely all the space. And what we did is an installation that during five days, very slowly, these guys, they were mounting in a certain order that we told them, they were somehow dressing the pavilion with a new material, but at the same time undressing the, material, the, the pavilion from its materiality, so erasing or changing the materiality of the pavilion, erasing the reflections, and very slowly, five days, to end with this. Very perfect. So at the end, after five days, we had this. And when I said that we like perversion, I was exactly talking about this. The feeling when you moved inside the Barcelona Pavilion without materiality, even the sound was different, the smell was different, everything was different, but the physical space was the same. So actually the plans, if we drew the plans of this pavilion and the pavilion five days earlier, they are exactly the same, the lines are exactly the same but the feeling was absolutely different, okay? And you may wonder, okay, you had fun, no? But why did you do that? Or, I mean, what was the point? Okay, there were many points, and we will try to explain, I don't know, four, five, six, three, I don't know, some of them. The first one, which is quite obvious, is how important materiality is in the perception of space, okay? We, when, when you draw a line in your plans, that line is super powerful, it's not just a line. That line, it's not the same if it's travertine, if it's a green marble, if it's a red, yellowish onyx, if it's wood, if it's metal, if it has reflection, if it absorbs sound, if it smells, etc., etc., etc. All that is crucial in architecture. And Mies, of course, he knew. Actually, these are photos of the original pavilion, because you all know that the pavilion that we have now in Barcelona is a reconstruction from 1986, okay? The original one was from 1929, from the, from the um, uh, Universal uh, Exhibition. No? And the photos of the pavilion, well, there are many things here. The photos of the pavilion, first of all, they were all in black and white, all. So everybody who talked of the pavilion, Philip Johnson, Henry Russell Hitchcock, I don't know, whoever, everybody who at that moment talked of the pavilion and enthroned it as an icon of modern movement had never seen it. They had not visited the pavilion. And actually, the few people, just a bunch of Barcelonians, nobody else, I mean, well, somebody from some other pavilion, but very few people, and especially very few architects, saw the original pavilion. And the few ones that saw it and wrote about it, like for example, uh, architect, landscaper from Barcelona called Nicolau Maria Rubio y Tuduri, he wrote, and many others, when they wrote about the pavilion, what was most striking was the luxur luxurious materials that were used, the incredible reflections of the big glass windows, that was the shocking thing at that time. Very few people were talking of the fluidity of space and of the tangency of the planes, no, it was more about the materials, okay? And Mies, who knew this, of course, uh, he, he controlled very much the photographs that were taken from the pavilion, okay? He directed them and even he banned some photos so that they were not seen. And now you will see why. And for example, in this case, well, you have to think that to, to do this installation, the installation, it was done very quickly in five days, okay? But we had been two years working on it studying the pavilion, studying the previous works of Mies, biography, other works, etc., etc. People who had uh, written about it, people who wrote about the reconstruction, people for the reconstruction and against it, why, etc. No? And these, in these photos, there is one thing that is uh, very interesting and which I hope it is a surprise for you, that it is that even if Mies tried to control what was shown, something escaped, and in this case, in this photo here, which is one of his official photos, when you zoom 
in that area there, which is something that we did like freaks because we were checking all the photos, every, every detail, there you will see original photos. when you zoom, you start to see here some letters. When you zoom a little bit more, and here it says Magi degustaciones gratuitas. <laughs> eh? Irene, you know. Magi degustaciones gratuitas means Magi is a, 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 a brand of, a, of soup, of soup, uh, soup cubes. And degustaciones gratuitas, it's like Campbell's, okay? It, it means uh, taste it for free. And you're like, what is this? Why is there an ad of Magi and taste it for free in the middle of the pavilion? And it is because the reflections that Nies was working so much, in this case, they were negative because through the reflection of that glass, what you were seeing was, and here you see it, the pavilion that was in front of the Barcelona pavilion, actually, which was banned from all the photos that Mies directed because he was crazy when he knew that this, oops, sorry, uh, that this pavilion from Mahi was going to be built in front of his. Actually, there are some theories because the original plans in one of the versions, there are many versions, but in one of the versions of the plans of the pavilion, this wall here didn't turn. It was stopping here, which is something somehow strange because actually many times, many critics uh, and historians have explained the, the, the pavilion as four corners that define the space, eight columns, and then uh, movable or tangent, I don't know, tangent planes, no? Uh, so actually there are some theories that say, sorry because I don't control this, that actually when he knew that here there was coming the Magi Degustaciones Gratuitas pavilion, he said, hey, we have to do something, turn the wall. And this is something that, no, si non è vero è ben trovato, as the Italians say, no? Uh, because it also, and, and our installation tried to do also that, tries to somehow demystify the figure of Mies. Okay, Mies was a guy who was smoking cigars, who was uh, drinking cognac, who we have seen photos of him uh, half drunk, no, sleeping in a couch. I mean, he wasn't a machine, okay? And that's good that some things happen because they happen. And this is normal in architecture. And when we do a project, we design it, and then in the work site, we see that we have done mistakes and we say, hey, come on, no, let's change this. And that's very healthy. I mean, I think that's healthy. Society, Mm, tries to bring us to the perfection and that you can't touch anything in the work site and that you can't touch the budget, but come on, life is not perfect. Okay, so if it's not perfect, why do we try, try to be, no? So, actually the, si the height of the pavilion comes also from the size of the onyx stone that was found. And it was that, that measure, the one that multiplied per two, gave the height of the pavilion and from that came everything, okay? Well, so this is, you will see some images of the pavilion in this perverse uh, moment. And then there are other, um, other reflections uh, here in, the, in our installation. Like this one that we used to, we used to, we like to say that the, what we had done with this installation was to convert the, uh, the pavilion into a model one-to-one, one, in scale one-to-one, one, okay? Because somehow we were turning the, the time backwards. Usually you first do a model and then you do a building, okay? But in this case, there is a game of representations where we, would we wanted to add a new layer because you have to think that the original pavilion from 1929, it was explained to the audience the day of the opening that it was a representation of the German soul. Okay, and, and as a representation of the German soul, Mies and Lili Reich, what they did is to design a pavilion in a way that could be understood as a house. Actually, when you see the pavilion, it could be a house. It has the swimming pool, it has the garden, it has more or less the living room in front of the onyx. I mean, it's an open, fluent space, but it can be associated to a house. And actually, Mies, when he did this, he had only designed houses except two housing blocks, in one in Berlin and the one in, in Stuttgart, no? in, the, in the Weissenhof. So actually, it was a, he was an architect of houses, 
okay? And when he represents the German soul, he does it via a house, okay? So the original pavilion was a representation of the uh, German soul, but the reconstruction from 86 is a representation of the 1929 building, which was representing the German soul. And by turning it into a one-to-one -one scale model, we were adding one more level. This is a representation in one-to-one -one of the reconstructed pavilion of 86 that represents the pavilion from 29 that represents a German soul, okay? And at the same time, we were playing with this, with this idea of time that models usually are made before the building, because actually, Mies is the only architect that we know who has built a one-to-one -one scale model in wood and white sheets, supposedly, now we will talk about this, for the Kroller Muller house uh, in 1912 for the competition that he didn't win, okay? And actually, years later, in an interview on TV, Philip Johnson, which you can't trust, of course, okay? You never trust people like Philip Johnson, or neither trust what Mies says, because, I mean, they are, what they used to do was to create a history of themselves, okay? But that's the information that we have. Philip Johnson said that in one night, with Mies probably having some cognacs, Mies told him that this was fake, okay? That actually, he never wrote that, eh? Uh, every, everywhere in all the biographies and in all the books you will find that this was built. But Philip Johnson says that Mies said that actually this was a photomontage. And actually from this model there are only two photos, okay? And they are very well done and who knows? And again, si no nevero ben trovato, no? We don't know if it's a model, if it's, if it's a, if it's a um, uh, uh, collage, but anyway, it's, it was a model of a building that was never built. And our model was the model of a building that was built but didn't exist anymore because it was knocked down, okay? Okay, another way to see it, or another reflection is that instead of thinking that it's a model, you can also think that it's a collage by Mies because Mies, when he represented his buildings, he always, or 99% of the times, he always represented his buildings with perspectives, okay? And this is very interesting because Mies never did an axonometric drawing. And that's shocking, no? I mean, come on, one guy who is from the modern movement, no, modern movement, when I think of the modern movement, I see the, you know, the front page of the, of the Kenneth Frampton book, no? And, and it was the Sartori's uh, axonometric, no? I mean, at least in the Spanish version. I, I think that in the English one also, no? Uh, the axonometric is the drawing of the modern movement because it's somehow, it's, it, it objectifies architecture, no? It makes it uh, something pure, something abstract, something uh, international, no? Coming to the, eye level and doing a perspective, it, it's an, an absolute different way of understanding and of explaining architecture. But then the other thing is that me as what he did is, I take a white sheet and I don't draw the materials, I don't draw the planes, I draw the joints. And that's very interesting. And that's something that, for example, Leverens, no, in many of his buildings, he doesn't work with bricks, which of course he does, but he works with the joint. The material of Leverens is the joint. And in this case, the material of uh, Mies uh, collage is the line, and the line that represents the joint. So actually, well, sorry, and then some figures, some collage, okay, to give scale, to give uh, depth, etc. And actually, the photos that we took of our installation, they are doing exactly the same thing. It's as if this was a white sheet, you just draw the lines, and then you collage some images. No? These photos are from Adria Goula, that he's a superb uh, uh, photographer and good friend of ours, as you can see by the adjectives I say of him. Uh, but I mean, it's exactly that. It's these perspectives, no? Brought to photography. And then a very interesting thing, no? See, I like it, eh? I don't know if you are enjoying, but. Then a very interesting thing, which is this here. When we did the installation, a very, important old architect in Barcelona, which we won't say the name, and he came to us very angry, extremely angry, saying that, ah, oh, now, Jenny, what have you done? 
you didn't respect the joints of Mies. And we said, come on, what are you saying? Of course, they are all respected. They are exactly all the same. And he said, no, you are lying to me. Well, oh, come, come on, well, whatever you want. You are lying to me. And he said, the sentence was, you are lying to me because Mies would never do that. He left, of course. We said, well, OK, well, what else can you do? But what he was, and we were in front of this space. And what he was saying is that Mies would never do that this joint doesn't match with this joint. And actually, there are many others because these ones, they don't match. But actually, they don't have to match. The, the, the right thing is that they don't match because this is travertine, okay? And this is travertine also. When the travertine means the tra meets the travertine and the travertine is a clear stone, so it's a stone where you see the joints, the joints, they match, one to two, okay? These are more or less squares. In reality, they change a little bit, but let's say that they are squares, okay? And these are rectangles, two to one. So one joint matches, the other one is in the middle, and everything looks perfect. Okay, that makes sense because somehow what Mies is doing here, ah, sorry, and the columns, the eight columns, they all match in the crossings of these joints. What is, what is he doing? He's setting the, the chessboard, okay? This is the chessboard. These are the rules where now we will start playing, okay? But then all the other walls, the walls that are green marbles and the uh, onyx, they don't match, the joints don't match. But, but it has to be like that because actually what the pavilion is saying is that these walls, they are not burying walls. And what, which is also false by the way, I mean, that's, that's something that should be said. Theoretically, they were not bearing walls, and the explanation of the building was to say that they were not, though at the end, for constructive reasons, some were. Okay? But let's imagine that they were not, because that was the idea. So these uh, non-bearing walls, what they do is that they move. They are displaced. They are, they are somehow not in their position. And to show that they are not in their position, the best thing they can do is not to uh, match the joints. I mean, that's, that's perfect. That's what it has to be. But what happens that usually in, their, in its natural uh, position without our installation, these walls, they have the green marbles. The green marbles, they are made in this mirrory way for other reasons that I won't now get into it. But the green marble, it's a darker material and it's more like a magma. So the joints, they are, they are visible, of course, but they are not so obvious. So even an architect from Barcelona, who is a very well-known architect and who has studied the pavilion, he had never noticed that the joints were not matching. And why is that? Because we have some this, this preconceived idea that Mies was God, no? That Mies was like a super machine, that everything was perfect. And it's not, it's not, no, there are no gods anywhere, not, neither in architecture, they are normal people, that they just live their life and that they have their normal problems, okay? And that they are very good, of course. But, but joints, they don't have to match. So this happens here and this happens in many other places, okay? You can see, etc. cetera, no? The onyx, one matches, but then this one doesn't. And that's something that when you see it, when the installation was on and all the materials are the same, you don't make distinction and you see all the joints, that's something very obvious, and it even hurts a little bit, no? And you see that this one is here, and this one is not, it's like, ah, oof, come on. But no, it has to be like that, okay? Okay, and then another thing, and this maybe it's one of the things that we enjoyed most, no? That it's to think of an installation as a, as a, as a critique, as a radical critique on the way we explain, or on the way that historiography in general has explained the modern movement, okay? Let's go backwards now. We go to 1932, to the exhibition in MoMA, okay, curated by uh, Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock, where somehow um, the idea of the modern movement and of the international style was set, okay, for the first time. It's kind of the, not the beginning. And in this exhibition, you can find the catalog in the MoMA uh, page, and you can download it, a PDF. It's fantastic. Do it, and you have it at home. And you will see some strange things. First, the list of participants. The list of participants, Frank Lloyd Wright, Gropius, Corbusier, Oud, Mies, uh, Raymond Hood, 
Hose and Lecas, Neutra, and Bowen Brothers. It's a strange combination, okay? And the thing is that it's not only a strange combination, but it's a strange combination and also and in black and white. Let's remember that all the photos were in black and white. When you do a curatorship, okay, when you are a curator of an exhibition, what, what you try to do or your first goal is that the message that you want to explain mm, gets easily and fluidly to the audience, okay? And in this case, when you read the, when you read the, the catalog of the exhibition, you see that there are three main aspects that they are repeated all the time, okay, but the two curators, which are the fluidity of space, okay, well, fluidity, it's, it's straight from Spanish, eh? but you, you, I guess you know what I mean, uh, flat roof and whiteness, whiteness, okay, white in general. And then you think, come on, white? And in this catalog, there is, you saw, old, I mean, old, where is he, here? Old has nothing, I mean, it's color, it's an explosion of color, red, blue, uh, yellow, it's, it's, it's pure color, no? Right, I mean, whiteness in right, well, maybe, okay, but it's, it's not exactly like that. But when you show all the photos in black and white, even the luxurious materiality of the Mies van der Rohe Pavilion, of the Mies and Reich, the Barcelona Pavilion, seems, even the travertine looks white, and when you take, well, I don't have it here, but when you take photos of, of the, um, uh, of the Tugendrat house, they put this one from inside, but also one from the back facade, which is more whitey than the other one. So, in black and white photos, and under this um, package of text, it seems that m the first modern movement was white. And you may think, well, the Weissenhof was white. No, no it wasn't. The Weissenhof was clear. And Mies, when he created the Weissenhof, he asked to, the, to the, all the participants to use in the outside mm, basically or predominantly clear colors, not white colors. And actually, when you go to the Weissenhof and you see the Le Corbusier's buildings, one is called the blue house and the other one is called the pink house or green, now, okay, but, and, and, and it's full of color. So actually, this idea that the modern movement, uh, the first modern movement was basically white, it's something that has been repeated in historiography, in the way we explain history, and it started here, it started in the MoMA catalog, but of course with black and white pictures, okay? And actually, when you look at it, it's not exactly like that. When you visit no, all that modern movement, you see that actually it, it, it's not that whitish, okay? There's a book by Mark Wigley that it's called White Walls Design Addresses, which actually addresses this, this, this uh, theme. So the installation, what it did was, okay, if that was the idea of the modern movement and this building was one of the icons of the modern movement, let's see what happens if we bring it to what you are saying that was the first modern movement. Let's turn it all white. And what happens is a disaster. It's that we, we destroy the building, okay? We, we make it much poorer, okay? Well, we, we, we annihilate it, no? Okay, I have more stories, but I will talk too much. Then just one thing. It was very interesting to see how materiality makes is so powerful in the movement of people. When you go to the Barcelona Pavilion, and now if you have been there, try to remember, you somehow enter, okay, you enter from the stairs, you go, and there is a moment that you get trapped for some strange magic reason, you get trapped around the onyx stone and you are there and you are looking at the onyx stone. Always when we go, there are no, many people here. They are all looking to the onyx, to the, to the courtyard, etc. But nobody is looking outside. When we did the installation, it was very nice to see that as the onyx had disappeared and it was as banal as all the rest, everybody was looking to this direction, outside, because people needed some imperfection, some life, something real, and not just this vinyl plastic all around, okay? Uh, and this imperfection, it was very nice also to see because when we did the installation, we asked the Mies van der Rohe Foundation 
not to clean it. It was uh, supposed to stay for 11 days, and we said, hey, don't clean it, because it will, it will be very nice to see how it's perfect, perfect, uglyly perfect the first day, and how it wears off, and how it gets dirty, and how we see the steps, and how we see where people have walked and where they haven't. But they were a bit scared about it, and they said, hey, mm, we will just clean the morning shift, which is something that they always do, okay? In the, in the Barcelona Pavilion, every morning, I don't know if it's at six, there is one person who cleans the whole thing, and it seems that this is untouchable. But anyway, it was very beautiful to see these photos from the last day, how the roce. Well, the touching of the people, but yeah, also... The touching like this, or the desire to see what's behind the plastic. And people were doing like... And looking, ah, oh, okay, it's there. And that was something that it was very, very nice for us to see that people somehow, they loved the pavilion. And when they saw that they had lost it, they, were, they went to see that if it was still there and, and they were like released. So we took photos of all these places, no? Here you see that this is the green marble, this is the onyx, where they had checked what happened. And this idea of imperfection, actually, it was implicit in the same uh, pavilion because when it was all white, you could see how the stones and all the joints, well, you have seen it here, how the joints, they are not, they are not, you see, they are not uh, exactly, because the stones, they don't match, because, I mean, well, because it's a, at the end, it's a person who cuts it and puts it, and, and we are not robots, no? So, they are not exact. And that's something that when ma the materiality is there, you can accept it, because the materiality somehow hides or, or puts in a second plane this kind of imperfections. When it's all white and all perfect, then the problem is that these imperfections, you see them and you see them as something negative, when actually they shouldn't be. And actually Mies, when he did the pavilion, this is one of the photos that wasn't uh, authorized by him, but, well, there are many stories about the construction, but one of them is that they were not finishing the pavilion. I mean, they were out of time. The, the, the pavilion had to be opened in one week and the whole thing was a disaster, okay? I mean, we won't get it, uh, he almost resigned, I mean, he almost was kicked out, etc. So, at the end, they decided, first, they decided to build it with, with a traditional construction site I, uh, techniques from Catalonia, so actually it's a super modern building constructed with the very more traditional building ways of the workers that they had available, okay? And then another thing is that at the end, as the pavilion was only, see, uh, only thought to be seen from this side, because actually the pavilion was only a stage where the kings of Spain had to toast with the German authorities and enter from here, toast in here, and get out from this door to a series of 15 other exhibitions and pavilions that were also designed by Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich. I mean, they designed a, a, a whole set of exhibitions, and this was just the opening door. So what they did is that, okay, guys, we don't have time, what do we do? They said, as this wall won't be seen, let's not finish it. So they took the, uh, the travertine, they put it, clad it on this side, okay, on the, the, the other side, they turned only two stones, you see, two pieces, and all this wasn't clad it. Okay, they said, ah, nobody will see it. Okay, hey, Mies, eh, the god, he said this. So nothing, and nothing happens. And then what we did in the installation in this, actually nobody knows, as nobody knew at the time that this has been done like that, what we did is that we, oh, oh sorry. Uh, in the 1986 reconstructed pavilion, the one that we have now in Barcelona, this is all cladded, okay? So again, there is this idea, of, well, actually the perfection is all cladded, but actually it wasn't like that. So in our installation, what we did is that we only did these two. We only cladded these two with white, and we left the rest as it was. Nobody saw it, we just know it. At night, at home, when we are alone, we laugh and ha ha ha, we did this, 
and that's enough, and we explain it every now and then, but at the moment, uh, nobody, nobody knew it, no? But it's this idea that, well, and so what, no? Okay, and then during four or five days, there was this um, slow process of, of taking out the dress, and these vinyls that we took off, we saw a very interesting thing, and it was that, well, we did it also in a certain way, like, well, here dressing the Colbes sculpture, one interesting thing, uh, I, can, I can stop, sorry. It, it will get a bit longer, but it's interesting. The Colbes uh, sculpture, for many years, it was thought to be, uh, to be called uh, the dancer, okay? Because, of course, when you see in Spain a sculpture like this, immediately you say, ah, dancer, Sevillana dancer, it's clear, no? So for many years, it was called the dancer, but actually some years ago, it was found that uh, the original name, it wasn't the dancer, it was Der Morgen, no? uh, the morning, the, the ob, the light from the morning. No? Light from the morning would be more or less the translation. And it's very beautiful to see why is that, because actually the Colbe sculpture, that this is not the original, it's a reproduction, but anyway, it's exactly in the same position, in the very early morning when the sun gets up in Barcelona, just there is one moment that just when it gets over and it shines to the face of the sculpture, the hands are stopping the light to go to her eyes. And because it's very beautiful. German women don't dance like this. <laughs> okay, well, and then all these vinyls that we took, it was very nice to, or very interesting to see that when we took it, they, they retained the, the texture of the stone. So it was, it was as if we had scanned the whole uh, Barcelona pavilion. You took the vinyl and you could see all the stone, uh, well, as if uh, when you do a peeling no, to your nose, that you, you take all the dirt, it was exactly the same. No? So actually the pavilion had never been as clean as the day after our, our installation. And what we did is that when we saw that, we thought, wow, this is very interesting because we have a scan one-to-one -one of the whole pavilion. So we thought that we took all the vinyls, we piled them all together, so, and we did this block. Of course, we cut the edges to make it uh, no, more perfect. In this case, no, a, a perfect imperfection because it's ugly, it's gluey, it smells like plastic. But here, in this disgusting block, you have all absolutely all the surfaces of the Barcelona pavilion. And a, a pavilion that actually is talking of planes, of fluidity, of space, for us it was somehow interesting to turn it into a massive, gluish, ugly, and disgusting block, which is now in the collection of the Mies van der Rohe Foundation. Okay, okay. you go. <laughs> Let's get back to Earth and uh, talk of a, of a housing project of ours. This was the first project that we ever did together a small, small house in a village called Gausas in, in one and a half an hour north from Barcelona, uh, in a little village that there is no, no, no services at all. Uh, and there was an existing house, and we got the assignment to do a small house that could be a studio for painting, but could host also the adult kids of the of the family for weekends or for, or for summers. So uh, with a very, very simple program, uh, having a big area that could use, be used for painting and uh, two rooms that could either be storage rooms or there could be bedrooms. In the end, uh, the, these adult kids, friends of ours, they actually invaded the whole house. Uh, and very few paintings were ever painted here. And it is really, it's a, it's a weekend we can home for, for this family. Anyway, the, uh, the first premises of this house was that it had to be extremely economical. Typical first assignment for young architects. Uh, there's a lot of confidence, but not that much. So uh, we had a really, really, really low budget. Uh, in the name of this house, if you look at it uh, in our uh, webpage, for example, is a Casa en Gausas for 70,000 euros. For the information of all of you, you don't build a house with 70,000 euros and you shouldn't ever offer a house for 70,000 euros. But here it was, uh, there's a little bit of trick because as it depends from the, the main house, all the installations came uh, straight from there. But in our case, um, 
uh, the strategy that we we were of course very eager to do this house because we had it was our our first one so uh, we jumped to the project uh, immediately and and started to think that okay how do you do a very cheap house how do you do a very uh, low cost house but that could still be called uh, architecture and uh, the conclusion is that you have to make a box the the easy thing is to make a box that has a size that a local um, uh, constructor, one guy and his son, can build together, that there is no machinery needed um, for the excavating for the foundations, yes, and for maybe uh, getting the, the beams up, but uh, to do the house that is actually built every day in Catalonia. A brick wall house with a sloped roof, and some windows uh, perforated to it. So um, this is basically what it is, six meters span, uh, prefabricated concrete beams, all the same, uh, and, uh, and uh, following the local rules, which was to have a 30 uh, degrees uh, pitched roof. But they didn't describe to which direction, so we pitched it inwards, and uh, now I'm a little bit showing all the images, and maybe I should be going to the section or, 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 or here. So what we do is that in this pitch roof, we collect the water of the, of the fairly large surface of the fairly small house, so, so all of it, uh, for, the, for the close by garden, and, uh, and also in that way we get a higher space for the for the big space and a little bit more height also to the to the rooms and all the lower space contains the kitchen and the, and the bathroom and the, or the more practical uh, entrance. Okay, what's the problem with the with the very cheap construction and with the very basic technology in 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 Catalonia and in the whole Mediterranean? is that you have a, a brick wall built in fairly bad quality brick and uh, then what you would do is to, to have a mortar or a layer of mortar to finish it and then paint. This, this would be the easiest way to finish uh, a wall of a house in, in Gausas, in a village of, of northern Catalonia and so many other places. So what happens with a wall like this? It gets small cracks and small imperfections that are not uh, harmful at all. They, they are just part of the natural movement of the material, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be dangerous or they wouldn't be a mistake or anything. But what they do is they accumulate all the, all the dirt and the rainwater and they end up giving uh, kind of very quickly um, an awful image of the, of the house. So there is this imperfection that we already know that we will get uh, bad results by time. So our solution for that was to uh, add a layer of such a strong graphic motive that it would uh, hide the, the imperfection behind it. It would happen anyway. The, the cracks would be there, the whiteness of the wall uh, would have uh, some gray stains and so on. But the green pattern would always win the battle between the, the different uh, perfections and, and, and imperfections. The same way also the, the absolutely cheap uh, cane porch adds another layer also or another pattern to the, to the vertical stripes in a way that somehow when the sun moves we can also see the, the shadows that uh, they change the pattern of the, of the house. In the back side of the house, a little bit like Mies, not still knowing all these tricks of Mies because this was very much earlier uh, than, the, than the pavilion project, we thought, okay, let's paint the back side just green because, uh, in fact, we had to be the painters in this house as well. We were not only the architects, but we were, unfortunately, also the painters who had to mark all the stripes with the... Uh, with this painter's tape and, uh, and paint it and, <laughs> and all, the, all the fuss. However, even if it had been a professional painter who ha would have uh, to do this, would it be necessary to cover all the house with the stripes? So only the 
clearly visible sides from the landscape were painted with, or with a stripes. The stripes have this explanation of the, of the stains and the, the imperfections that you, somehow you could already maybe see some, this is very, these are photos done very quickly after the, finishing the house. But the other um, uh, function that these stripes have is to, this is what we would call in, in Spain, we would call a chalet, which is a house, uh, a, a vulgar house, uh, just a cube somewhere in the landscape uh, surrounded by a beautiful forest, uh, um, agricultural land, and so on and so forth. And uh, when it was just mortared, uh, we already had the idea, but we could kind of testify that, okay, what, what I, what's, the, uh, what's the image or the lecture in the landscape of this house when it is just gray, light gray, so almost white, something uh, that would, would uh, contrast very clearly with the forest behind it. So, um, what we had is uh, a chalet, uh, a, a cube that clearly says, I'm a construction, I'm a house, and I have come here to invade, the, uh, invade the, my, my spot. And the moment that we painted the stripes, it suddenly got fragmented and got to uh, somehow uh, a much less aggressive um, role in the, in the whole landscape and uh, the forest behind it. So somehow the house, the chalet, uh, turned into a pavilion and it's somehow a much more um, sane or much more healthy relationship with the, with the surrounding landscape. Okay, now slow and that's what we have been today, so maybe we can <laughs> leave it here. No. Okay. Um, well, let's see if you can do it. See, si. is it okay? Do we have still more time? Yeah. Are you bored or? Well, I'll try to be quick because. But this is interesting. I think. Um, yeah, slow. What do we mean when when we say that we are slow? This is something that we say to our clients always when they come, and that's why we lose. 90% of them, when they come, we say, okay, yeah, yeah, we can do it, but we are slow. Because usually they come and I want this for, I don't know, next week, and we say, we can't do it. Because we have to think, we have to doubt, we don't have everything clear, sometimes we go back and sometimes we go forward, and I mean... But above all, we have to think, and anyway, somehow we would be paid to think. Yeah, but this is something that it's not that much understood, and. Now I will go backwards. When we were studying, no, uh, this is a, a, somehow a thought on, on what's our profession. Now, what do we do, architects? Actually, what, what is it that we are doing? Because we tend to think that architects work with space, and it's true, but now let me explain you a theory that actually says that actually we work with time more than with space. And I will try to explain why. When we were studying, and I guess may, it happened to many of you, no? we, well, we, ban, we bumped with this book no? by Rudowski, no? The Architecture Without Architects, where you could see many buildings, constructions, that were absolutely marvelous, absolutely. And we were in the university, and we were studying history, we were studying geometry, physics, mathematics, uh, aquarelle, uh, or drawing, uh, what else, uh, urbanism, uh, aesthetics, I don't know, we had a bunch of, of um, subjects, and of course, and we thought, wow, these guys, they didn't study all that, and they did this so perfectly, and then you start to think, okay, what's wrong? I mean, am I stupid? No, first thing that you think, I mean, what, what's the problem here? Or who actually did these buildings? No, because they are, they are, I mean, if, if they were lead, no, lead, uh, if you did a lead uh, consultancy, they would be more than platinum, no? They would be the perfection of sustainability, of uh, resources, durability, efficiency, they are perfect. But the thing is that these buildings, and I will put a Masia Catalana, the traditional Catalan rural house as an example, these buildings, they were not designed. They were done 
by somebody, no? let's imagine in the 15th century, one farmer who arrives to this landscape and suddenly thinks, oh, this is a nice place to stay, and he goes with his donkey and with a couple of sheep, okay? And then he builds a small hut with some branches that he found. After two days, there comes a storm and the branches blow away, and he thinks, well, maybe I should do it with something heavier. And then he takes some stones, and then he lives there for some years, and his daughter uh, takes the donkey. <laughs> this, no, now it's three or four donkeys, maybe 10 sheep, etc., and thinks, hey, when it rains, we have a problem with water here. Why don't we do the roof in this other way that I have seen a neighbor who does it this way? And like this, generation after generation and generation after generation, after... And, and collectivity. Yeah, yeah, and collectivity. After 500, 600 years, we get a building like this that it's perfectly set in the landscape, uses the materials that found around so it didn't pollute anything, collects the rainwater, it's perfect for um, um, managing the fields that are around, uh, uses the heat of the animals to heat the upper floor where the family is living. When you put the chimney in winter, it's perfectly warm. In summer, it's cold inside. It's perfect, absolute perfection. And then you think, okay, then who designed this? And when you think about it, actually who designed it, it's nobody, it's time. It's a little bit like natural selection, no? Like in biology, the natural selection, you say, wow, this snake from this river, how is it that it's so well adapted to this situation? Well, because of natural selection. So this is a little bit the same thing. And then there is one thing that architects, we don't have 500 years to design a building. You can't say to somebody who comes to, to you and says that, hey, I want an office building. You say, okay, you just wait 500 years and you will have it. No, you can't do that. So what are we doing when we design? What, are, what is it exactly that we are doing? We are compressing these 500 years of time into, the client would like some weeks, we would say some months, okay? Into a couple, three months. And what do we do during these three months? We take our pencil and sketches, we draw, we use our imagination, but actually with our imagination, when we are drawing, what we are doing is taking our DeLorean, we are going to the future, we see what happens if we build that thing that we are drawing, we see all the problems, and then we come back. And we say, hey, I saw that if we do it like this, we will have all the water, we will have water problems here, this function won't use, now we need, we need better shades because this is not well oriented, and then we draw another thing, we go back to the future, we check it, and come back. And we are all the time going back and forth to the future, and every now and then, we even do a small trip to the past to see, hey, how did they solve it? How did, how did Plechnik do it here? Let's say, oh, well, that's interesting. And what about this other one? What did he do? So we are all the time traveling. We are time travelers. It's fantastic, no? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, to me, it sounds like, wow, being an architect, it's great. I mean, who else can travel in to the future and to the past and see all these things and come back to the present and explain them? So actually, our most powerful tool is time. Space comes afterwards. Actually, what we do when we travel to the future is not to see how the spaces are. It's to, to be sure of what will happen in these spaces. So the important thing is not how things are, but what these, what these spaces allow to happen. It's the life that happens in our buildings, what is important, not the photography that we take for the magazine, okay? So it's life, the important thing. So we, if we think in that way, and that's the way we try to think, and that's the way, way that we try to our students to think as well, that they, understand that actually time is the important thing and imagination because without imagination you can't travel to the future neither to the past or anything okay and of course if you have to travel so much you need time also you can't be fast you have to say to your clients hey come on you are asking me to go 10 times to the future and five times to the past and you wanted me to do it in one afternoon i can't i need time i'm slow i'm sorry so that's a good thing when we say that we are slow, we think it in a good way because we have to travel a lot. In this case, what we thought, it was with a very 
particular family. One Belgian guy who comes to us and says, hey, I bought an old chocolate factory in this village in the north of Catalonia, and um, I have a family of 24. And it's like, come on, what did you do? And it's, no, no, there's a, there's a story. I have four kids, I divorced, I uh, married, or I don't know, a couple remarried with a, a person who has four more kids. The kids are already old, they have boyfriends and girlfriends, so we are 24, so I need a house that at some moments is just for me, okay, me and my colleague, and at some moments it's for 24, and well, you have to think that, okay, what do we do, no? And in this case, what we did, and I will try to go straight to the point, well, the building is beautiful, it's one of these projects that the, the, what you say is that, hey, we don't have to do anything, because it's, it's great, it's perfect, what, what you bought is magnificent. And the beautiful thing, especially beautiful thing of this uh, house, was the three different uh, um, slabs, or, well, slabs, I don't know if that would be the correct name, but the first one, it was with this very low Catalan vault, okay, with ceramic, okay, uh, metal beams, these ones, and then the vault, that everything works in compression. The second one was with these wooden beams, that that's not a, 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 that's not a use, uh, usual uh, floor in Spain, it's not, it's not common to find this, and the third one was the most typical one of the last, you know, the last roof of these traditional houses, okay? And the beautiful thing, this is already the project, but the beautiful thing was that all the floors that were quite big, around 200 meters each, uh, they were all open because it was a factory, so it was all open. There were no walls or anything. So all the time you could see this, this ceiling or these uh, floors you could see them in all their surface, and that was very beautiful. But of course, if you have 24 people, how do you do it uh, not to divide the spaces? No? So now you will see what we did. Basically, this is the ground floor, a swimming pool, it has to had a, have a swimming pool that every, all the house was around. This is a small flat that it's, well, disconnected to the house, but you can connect it if you want, if you have somebody at home. Then four kitchens four kitchens, and it's like, well, why do you want four kitchens? Well, the, the partner is a cook, so I don't know, it seems that she has to cook, no? Everywhere, okay, I don't understand it, but anyway. One kitchen here, another one there, another one there, and another one up. Okay, first floor uh, with rooms, and here you will see a strange thing that you see that there are these rooms, and then each one has a toilet in front, and then there is this door that it's actually a movable door. This door, it's only one, Okay, but you can put it either here, 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 or here, or not put it, and now you will see why. And then the upper floor, that it's more like uh, an apartment for, for them, no? for the couple. Okay, this is the section, uh, nothing. Okay, and the thing was that what we found was so great that we just decided to touch very, very small things, and we did this rule, which of course, whenever you do rules, it is to follow them and to not follow them whenever you want. That's why you, put, you set the rules. That's the nice thing of you setting the rules. But basically, there is the rule that whatever we touch, we paint it with this green, that this green is the green, typical green color of the uh, shades and windows of this village, okay? So in this case, this is the main entrance, okay? Main entrance of a house of 600 square meters. Usually, it's not a small door like this that you have to go down to enter, but it's beautiful. So why do we have to change it, okay? The client was very, very receptive in this way. So this is the main entrance, then this is the porch, and as we did a, an upper porch here, and we redid this lab that was all fallen down, we painted green, this is a new stair that we did, and then these were windows, like these ones, and as we opened them down, no, to have this connection uh, from the ground floor, uh, we, again, we paint everything green. No? So actually, you can see what we did just by seeing that what's, what's green, it's new. New or redone. What's not painted green, it was already there. Okay, well, the stairs, the new stairs out, outside, the upper porch, the view from the upper porch, this, this other flat here, then the, the, well, the connection with outside, one of the kitchens, and then these stairs on the back side, there, were, there was one stair that actually, this one, 
which of course doesn't follow any regulations okay, at all, but we left it as it was. I mean, we didn't do anything. It, it's exactly what we found. But then, at, very functional. and at the other side, what we did is these new stairs that now you will see in plan why we did that, which is this, okay? This, um, this is the, the first floor with the rooms that are these ones. It's a little bit like a monastery, no? A little bit like the, the rooms. And you can see here that the walls between the rooms, they, they get till the beam, till the metal beam, so you can see the, the roof. But what we do is that the walls that limit the rooms with the corridor and the corridor with the bathrooms, they don't reach the, the upper level, and then there is glass. So that when you move through the corridor, you have the, the, the view of all the slab. So that view that was so beautiful in the beginning, even if we have divided the whole floor, you still have the view of that. No? And on the other hand, all the light that comes from the windows, they go to the corridor and they go also inside the bathrooms so, so that you don't need uh, uh, electric, well, electrical light. No? And then the, the whole story to explain here is this one. The client said, okay, I want to come here. Sometimes I like to be with my, with my kids, but sometimes I like to be alone. And, I, and they, I don't know, they do things that I don't want to know, okay? And, and I do things that I don't want them to know, okay? Like in uh, any family. So what we did is we did a trick that this is the entrance, that small door, and here we did two doors, one here and one there. So that you can divide the house in two areas. Now, this would be for the uh, light gray family. Imagine that there is only one family. They come here and they have all the space, okay? All is for them. But now let's imagine that the, I don't know, that there are some of his kids and the parents are at home. The parents, they can have the apartment up here with a kitchen, living, etc. They have here a toilet and a living room and by going out from here, they go to the porch and from the porch, they go out to the swimming pool. And the other family, they go from here, they have the kitchen, table, living, and one, two, three, four, five rooms and four uh, toilets. And this is something that as that door is movable, you can divide. If the parents come with some friends, well, you can divide the house. And of course, you all meet in the swimming pool, but they all ha can have uh, different lives. No? Okay, and the upper floor, that it, well, it was like this when we, when we finished. Okay, and this is the last one, no? Very okay, shortly. This is the one that Tadej already mentioned, the one square meter project uh, interior measurement in this way, but of course a more effective name for a project. Uh, when we're dealing with a project that is just one square meter and uh, the program is a sh uh, shelter for a guard, of a big company. Uh, the size of the building is so small that it ends up being something between a building and a clothing. Um, this, when we thought about this, we remembered this uh, character from Asterix and Obelix who uh, has this uh, self-supporting jacket that uh, gives him a new form even and, and, and changes totally his, his aspect. That's like the surprise of the, of the comic. But there are these cases that uh, limit between building and clothing. It's a little bit diffuse. It's diffuse because of, of uh, playing with the idea or it is uh, diffuse because uh, people end up forming part of the architecture, or it's, it's diffuse because we need our, uh, our dressing as a real protection against the, the, the inclemencias. How well, no environment. Environment, uh, a hostile environment. That, that would be something that we could uh, read in very many explanations of, of architecture or the, where does the the need for housing come first to protect us from the, from the nature. Well, uh, this uh, is something that the clothing, of course, also, also does very much. Also, in the same way, the clothing is, uh, is a representation. You explain things of your social status, your, uh, your uh, role in the, uh, the role that 
you are playing or, 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 or here uh, with your dressing as well as what we do also by architecture. Uh, and there are very many examples of, of uh, dresses or uh, all kinds of structures of basalt and, and crinolines to uh, deform or uh, play with the, with the proportion or the size or the form of the, of the dress or the human body. Uh, this image uh, is especially nice because there is this limit that the, the kids are actually making hats inside the inside the crinolines and of course the lady is very angry uh, because of this misuse of the of these structures but it's obvious that that uh, you could even play under the, the dress of the of a lady easily especially if the the dresses uh, have this kind of a uh, this kind of size anyway in this uh, this case our project is in the entrance of a big bank um, uh, in the outskirts of Barcelona, and uh, what we are asked to do, and this is a building that we, uh, in fact, designed with, uh, with the father of Eugenie, the, the first in the, um, in the beginning of 2000, this part, and then uh, later in the 2012, uh, uh, we finished this, uh, this other part that is partly underground and partly in this office building. But now we were asked just for this one square meter building. Of course, we would have been happy to repeat our uh, thousands of square meters building, but anyway, uh, this is what we, <laughs> we do. We uh, respond to the client's uh, desires and needs, and this time it was just a need to protect the guard from the weather, and uh, especially from the heat in the summer or the rain in the, in the rainy days. Mm. So this is the, the actual plot, but doesn't have very, it's not uh, big, big, there's not big importance on that. So what we actually do is to build a coat and a hat to protect the, the guy. Anyway, the, the guard is always, uh, always out, only when it's too hot or if it's raining, he has a chair, not much else in the, in the hat. So he, he kind of gets into his jacket like the, the uh, Asterix character. Here, in fact, what there is, there is a, there is a prefabricated uh, guard box that we can understand as, as underwear in this scheme. So there would be the kind of ugly, unrepresentative uh, underwear. And then we would make a fine coat that has this kind of representative um, and, and, and dressing up a type of a look, and then the hat that, uh, of course, protects from the sol uh, sun, gives uh, natural ventilation, and also uh, gives this image almost as if it was this Italian, Italian nuns that you can see in uh, Fellini's movie. Okay, here, this little one, square meter rot <laughs> rotating, <laughs> rotating. And here on its uh, on its spot, uh, this photo I like to show it especially today that we have seen so many poplar trees uh, in 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 Ljubljana. So this is a, a small uh, homage to to Ljubljana, maybe unconscious, but uh, but anyway. But here you can see that okay, if we are, if we accept this uh, this uh, job as uh, designing dresses and hats, uh, then. Everything is about detail and confectioning the, the, the small uh, encounters of the material, separating the, the roof so that it has an independence, uh, getting the, the small details of the windows. Here you can see very well the, the prefabricated, very dull uh, plastic box that is the underwear. And somehow even this, um, this uh, plissé type of uh, finishing, it's a little bit playing with this idea of, of actually uh, working with textile, textile elements. But anyway, the, the thing in a small um, project like this, it's almost, it, we could talk of dressing, but we could talk also almost like of uh, furniture or, um, or, or street lights of uh, this kind of public uh, little elements that 
often accompany architecture and are, are not uh, directly considered as architecture. So the detailing is also something very similar to this uh, okay. uh, this object. Okay. And just to finish, because we talk a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, and there are people like Charles and Ray Ames who can brief in one concept, in just one image, all what we actually wanted to say today. They say, if this represents the area of interest of the design office, okay, we have interests, I hope you have seen them today, no, expressed in this lecture. And this represents the area of interest of the client. Okay, the client comes and asks for some things. Genuine interest. Genuine interest, yeah. And, and this is the key thing of this drawing, and this represents the area of interest of the society as a whole, and that's very important, and it's in all the projects, even in the one square meter, you have to think that, okay, how do I do it? Do I bring materials from far away? Do I do it with the local uh, iron man? Do I, etc., etc., etc. So, they say it's in this overlapping and only, only in this one where the three are overlapped, the three interests overlap, it's in this area where the design office, they say, can work with conviction and enthusiasm. And that's basically what we try to do in our life. It's to work always with conviction and enthusiasm. Thank you. If you like to make any questions, if you have or energy still, or, or something, we would be happy to answer it. Or if there are questions and just the thoughts. Yes, 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 Try to be. Yeah. He tried to be very good, and he was very good. But being good, sometimes it's contradictory yeah. be, with yeah. being perfect. And, that, and then, what, what I also like that your approach, or also your view towards, let's say, reality, is, is very optimistic. Mm -hmm. Just think that architecture or artists, architects, some, sometimes say, also that you give amnesty to all the shitty stuff, and then, then you do it. You work with it, and this is what I think is important for young architects or young architects to, to be that uh, you can build um, uh, uh, from something that's here and uh, try to build a new optimistic world out of it, a better world, uh, not, not to try to, to, to have an, an, an imagination of something perfect. But uh, this is what I find very, very interesting and very refreshing, and which I think in Slovenia you don't see often or often enough or not yet. So this would be my comment. Okay. okay. Thank well, thank you, thank you, yeah. What else can we say? <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, into this, uh, this thing of 
being young and uh, how to start and where, where are your dreams and your ideals. It's very good to construct yourself and uh, in this way all these ephemeral projects, not all, well, for example, yes, we were not there gluing the sheets, but we have done a lot of uh, mounting ourselves, not building houses. I would, I would, I would like to put bricks and, and see if the, well, the wall uh, is straight, but, but uh, the, like this painting yourself, the stripes, and thinking that if it really is possible, uh, or, or fixing some woodwork in, a, in an ephemeral installation, it's very good practice because you kind of get an idea uh, what you can ask from the materials or the techniques. Uh, it also gives you some kind of confirmation that you can think of stuff yourself and the common sense gets you quite far. For example, if you, if you get, uh, or if maybe you know already this Enjomari, uh, this uh, uh, Enzo Mari auto construct uh, uh, auto progettazione. Oh, eh? Auto progettazione is the, is the name of that. But it's like a um, book that Enzo Mari shares his uh, designs that are absolutely easy designs for furniture and, and well, beautiful. furniture. Absolutely beautiful with the idea that uh, all the wood is cut in 90 degrees and then it's just the way that you mount it that you get the ergonomy uh, working more or less. So, uh, if you have the chance to do things, whether it's cooking or whether it's uh, cutting wood or whether it's gluing paper or whatever, all these uh, give you the idea of where you can kind of push easily things to and what's the na uh, nature of the, of the material and the, the weight and the, all these kind of very basic, basic uh, things of architecture. Cook and eat well. <laughs> maybe we can leave <laughs> it. Any other comment? Just one question. Yes. It's not about the production or um, because okay, let's say in architecture history you have these architectural epicenters, let's say some country or some city or some part of the world. Uh, somehow uh, an architectural team develops that has a lot of attention from uh, from the profession. A lot of these, let's say, centers also died at some point. So actually, now no one is really interested in what's happening in Netherlands, for instance. Or, or maybe nothing interesting mm -hmm. happens. But I think that Spain has this really long and strong architectural culture you know, that's, mm -hmm. I don't know, 100 years or more um, long. That's, that you, you could say that it has this epicentric potential and that somehow still develops. So it never died. No, I, no. Yeah, you're right, you're right. In, uh, we are very lucky in Spain, actually. I mean, we have a long tradition of good architecture and somehow inside Spain it has been displaced because this idea of uh, now what's happening in Netherlands, no? Or what's happening in Spain, it, it happens also with uh, the regions of Spain. That there are, there are moments, for example, the 80s are Barcelona, but the 90s are Madrid. Nowadays, the focus, but, but this is something that, that it's a bit dangerous, eh? because one thing is the mediatic focus and the other one is reality, that there are always good things happening everywhere. Of course, there are also bad ones, no? But it's true that um, Spain has somehow had the, I don't know, maybe because we are so many. I mean, <laughs> there are so many architects, you bunch into architects everywhere. I mean that, I mean, with so many architects, for sure, there will, the probability that there are some that try to go, do good architecture is, is high, no? Uh, but, but you're right, it's a country that the interest in architecture has, has more or less been always there, no? But maybe Slovenia has a little bit the, the same uh, history that it has been able to uh, overcome this, um, this public interest uh, the public interest, like it's like this kind of uh, 
a lighthouse that does the radar and has to be all the time in movement and every now and then it hits uh, somewhere and then you see all the magazines suddenly Belgium, then France, whatever, and, and we can, but all these places where there is good architecture, for example, Belgium that has maybe been uh, during the last years like really much in the focus, or maybe France is nowadays, nowadays there are a lot of uh, young, very interesting studios in France. It is because there's all the time very good quality work done and, and because the, somehow the architecture matters. So I think that uh, we really have to, as a collective, we have to, uh, work in in having uh, good commissions and uh, being meaningful to the to the society and uh, and really getting work done in a way that it somehow uh, works together with the society and then the focus will at some point it will maybe pass and and we often talk about this um, this phenomena or this uh, saying very often they, uh, they say that oh, this guy was before his time or was ahead, of, ahead his time, no? of his time. No, he was just doing his thing and probably was really bad treated uh, of, by, his, <laughs> by his time because it wasn't the question at the moment yet. And this kind of uh, like failed or, or then later discovered experiments are happening all the time. It's just that somebody has to, uh, some Philip Johnson or, or somebody who has the authority has to to put the focus, focus there. So um, then, as I'm, I don't come originally from Spain, and I can talk because I have this kind of little bit exterior view of the of the Spanish architecture. I think that there is also a thing with this constant crisis because we we like to talk of our financial crisis in the 2007, 8, and uh, till. 14 or something like that. Then uh, we had a, we have had a really um, complicated political situation for the last years. Uh, then the pandemic and uh, what's next. Uh, but this is not something that our predecessors wouldn't have had. There was the there was the dictatorship. Then the and dictatorship that were, consisted of different phases as well. Uh, before that there was the. The, the Republic of Spain that lasted for, or for some years and was uh, very partial. And uh, in, the, in the 70s, for example, that uh, the generation of, of our fathers, whether biological or just uh, spiritual fathers of, of architects in, in Barcelona, for example, there was such a lack of resources and they had to fight with that. So all this ingenuity or or this common sense that you have to put to the architecture and think in very simple means to get somewhere a little bit more elevated. I think that that's something very, very typical uh, Spanish. And then there's another part that I envy very much as a, as a Finn, is that there is a, generally there has been a very great appreciation for cultural interest in general. So um, Barcelona and Catalonia, Spain, uh, you can find very well read architects and people who have uh, cultural interests in general and that's something that I think that has had, has been kind of a continuous phenomenon and and I hope it will I hope it will last and uh, survive Netflix and and all these <laughs> distractions that we have nowadays I just I, I don't have a it's more a comment or a thought or something because we were with students who were in Barcelona, I guess, what, a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to La Borda mm -hmm. and they introduced us to the whole space and everything and the concept and everything because we are also really interested to put forward the housing cooperatives mm -hmm. here. And the building was a really a result. It is obvious, it's a result of participation process. Um, I don't know, and oh, I was always thinking, yeah, participation always brings to the results that are, in a way, I would quote it or in, put it in the brackets, like imperfect architecture, mm -hmm. like a little bit, uh, I don't mm. know, shabby or, um, yeah, not so Gee. catchy to the architectural photographic eye or something. But still, the, the building, I think, it, it works very well. It adapts. It adapts with people living there. And I don't know, it's more a 
kind of, uh, it's not a question for you, yeah. but uh, what maybe, what is your opinion on that? Mm. Or how many, I don't know, these sort of practices are developing now, yeah. also in Barcelona, mm. like really working together with... This is, see, it's, it's a new phenomenon. In, yeah. And actually this building was not the first, but one of the first that actually was done in this system in the last, in the last years. And it's more, it has the, the, it has the force and the power of being an experiment for us. In other countries, this is very us usual and it's not an experiment at all, but in Barcelona it was. And then in this case, the architects who did it, um, it was one of his first projects. And I think that you can, you can feel some of that, though it's, it's very good. I mean, it works very well. People who, I mean, it's, it's, it's luxurious to live there. I mean, many people would like to live in a, in a place like that, no? Uh, now, there are coming more uh, experiences from Lacolle, these architects, and also from others. And in three, four years, we will see already six, seven, eight different strategies with different plots, mm, mm, some much smaller, and we will start to see uh, different ways that somehow Laborda showed. Because in, in Barcelona, it wasn't very common. The cooperative, they were very common uh, at the end of the dictatorship when the transition, but not, not in this way of, I mean, the results were much more um, vulgar, let's say. I mean, there was not an experimentation on space and on different ways of living. It was just that, that the, economically, it was, it was um, the, la gestio, the management was made in a cooperative, okay? But um, I don't know, I think we have to wait for two or three years. And see if, yeah. this, if yeah. this shabbiness is uh, also a statement or if it's also uh, like architecture always has this uh, part of representation or representativity. And of course, it's very different in a bank headquarters or in a, in a cooperative housing. So it's interesting to also see a little bit with perspective of time how much of this uh, shabbiness is actually like a kind of a way of uh, explaining things of the process. Mm. I, I don't mean shabbiness in a bad way. No, 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 no. no. And, and me neither. Me, yeah, yeah. Me yeah. neither, but it's a kind of um, not uh, like the contrary of the obsession of the detail, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe let's mm. put it like mm. this. <laughs> yeah, because however you're there, I mean, it's full of life. You, and you also can see that people are not doing things just like that, you know, just as they would want it, but they do yeah. do it in a sort of uh, controlled way, yeah. which they decide on together. I yeah. think that's yeah. kind of a good point. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a contrary to something really beautiful. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yes. And, and I think that what is getting more and more um, kind of important or, or relevant in, in architecture is not to get obsessed with the final image of the... Some, of course, it's sometimes it is, the, it, it is the thing that you have to do and, and you, want, uh, you want to do and that makes it make sense. But there are other situations where the, the architecture has to be something that it can have a certain adaptability or it can receive changes and it uh, can receive or react to inputs that the society actually shows that we have to, we have to change the ways or we have to be flexible or so. So uh, the, the idea of thinking of architecture as a, a finished project that has a final form, uh, it's of course a little bit uh, dangerous, especially if we uh, think that we will be working with built environment anyway. Uh, or started environment anyway. Okay, maybe we let people finish their their work. <laughs> so yeah, thank you once more, and uh, hope to see you again. Sure. Thank, uh, thank you. Maybe with another forum of participation. Okay. <laughs>